Court, and this is Tyler Crone with the 36th Legislative District Democrats, and we are so delighted to invite Shane to interview us with us this evening for Seattle City Council D5. Over to you, Shane, to introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shane McCumber. Um, I uh, so I am a longtime resident of Maple Leaf. I've lived in North Seattle for the better part of 22 years. I also grew up in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I grew up in Arlington, it's about 45 minutes north of Seattle. As it turns out, growing up as a gay kid in the 90s, uh, Arlington was not a great place. They made it very clear that I was not welcome. Um, so after I graduated, I moved to North Seattle and I finally found that community that really valued me for me and helped me grow and really find my confidence. But since I moved to North Seattle 22 years ago, I've watched all of those spaces that were so important for me places like uh, Cranium Cafe and the Greenwood Market and other locations that they're not only not there anymore, they've been replaced by big box stores and chain restaurants that don't give back to our communities and they don't give us the spaces to build connections with others like we had all those years ago. And I'm really concerned about what's going to happen for the kids that are growing up now that aren't going to get those opportunities that I have. And I really want to make sure that as we develop, because we are going to continue to grow as a city, we maximize those opportunities to make sure that we are focused on local economic opportunities for the people that are here in Seattle so that they can start businesses, they can feel confident, they can afford their home, and they can really make sure that they have those bonds of community and know that Seattle wants them to be here. I want to make sure that I am a voice to ensure that we have all of those items that are available for us. We deserve buses that show up on time and actually take us where we need to go. We deserve economic opportunities that make us feel fulfilled. We deserve an educational system that makes sure that our students are ready for the jobs of tomorrow as soon as they graduate. And I'm going to make sure that I am a tireless voice to make sure that District 5 uh, has those opportunities. <laughs> Thank you. The first question this evening will be asked by Sherry. Over to you, Sherry. Hi. Um, what steps will you take to ensure that the city remains safe for all, including Black, Indigenous, and LGBTQ plus people, while keeping police accountable to elected leadership and the community? The mouthful. It's for me, police don't prevent crime, they respond to it. And police, as, police are a symptom of uh, more systemic problems that exist in our society. We need to make sure that we are investing fairly and equitably in all of our school systems so that all of our students can graduate with the ability to succeed and also understand what their career is going to be. I am working on what I call the Pathways to Prosperity Project, which is focused around trying to build uh, actual hands-on experience for uh, high school students that are getting ready to graduate. So when they graduate, they know the specifics of the careers that they want to go in, and they can actually make that choice informed, as opposed to so many people that I graduated with who went to college for degrees they were never going to use or now carrying around debt for something that they never wanted because they didn't have a solid understanding of what that career would look like. Uh, also, housing is a huge part of it. Making sure that we have available housing for individuals and we do it in a way that is more informed than our previous urban village focus. Um, the way that they posited in the 90s to address the problems of housing and try to expand was with the, the idea of the urban villages, which unfortunately ended up being specifically um, detrimental to many of our uh, communities of color as they were the focal point for some of the development. And we need to do better on those ideas as we engage in development. Um, I have a background in, uh, I'm a realtor. Um, I've also got a background in mental health support. So it gives me a, a good vision of what it looks like when we have those spaces. And I wanna make sure that as we engage in development, it's not only focused around our transit systems, but it's also very aware of uh, the areas that they are going in to minimize the amount of displacement possible so that we can get affordable housing, but we can also keep the people and the neighborhoods together so people don't have uh, dispersed communities and feel uh, yet again. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how would you ensure that the city has an updated climate action plan and what specific actions would you prioritize to get us back on track to meeting Seattle's Green New Deal goals? Uh, 
our, our climate plan is something that we definitely have to lean into. Um, I'm a big proponent of density, but density needs to be done in a responsible way that ensures that we are not only upgrading the styles of which we are engaging with construction, but also ensuring that we are using um, focuses on better uh, green construction and also green materials. And in the development, we also need to ensure that we are preserving our green spaces. Um, preserving as much of the, the canopy within the city is something that we also need to be focused on. Um, also up in District 5, we have a lot of issues where we have a very ailing infrastructure and we need to have a conversation about what the upgrade of that is going to look like and how we can better address our drainage issues up in District 5. And by integrating those into the fact that we've already got the transit system being built, we can really focus ourselves on having the most green uh, positive impact as possible while also maximizing our density. Um, I think those are ways that we can really help address and bring up the way that we are building the city and try to minimize the carbon footprint that we're leaving behind. Thank you. The next question will be asked by Toby. So I, I noticed you didn't use all your time on that. Uh, remember the first bill, there's a 10 second bill and then another more obnoxious one at the end. It's, uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> the move Seattle levy is set to expire at the end of 2024. The next nine year transportation levy will go before the voters in November of 24 next year to begin in 25. What investments and improvements would you prioritize for the next transportation levy? Obviously, we've got our outlines planned for what we are doing around the light rail, but we also need to have a better conversation about what facilitating those stations that are going in is going to look like. Because just having those light rail stations open with the bus systems that we have right now is not going to be sufficient. We're going to need to fully realize that with the amount of density that's going in in the city, we're going to have additional problems that are going to get created on things like 145th and 130th the roads and spaces there are not going to be able to handle the amount of cars and the amount of parking uh, that comes along with it. So we need to ensure that our transit um, and investments for what that's going to look like are also accounting for the additional amount of buses that are going to be needed. If we are going to need to put in additional infrastructure to handle uh, providing space for buses to move up and down these roads and get people fully around the city in a meaningful way. There's also, Again, uh, we've got some additional complications that come along with areas like Lake City and also over in Aurora, where uh, additional development is going to be running into spaces where uh, single lane roads are going to be problematic, I think is the best word that I've got, um, in trying to mix in additional larger amount of buses with the, the small amount of cars and, and limited roads. So expanding some of those spaces, making sure that we've got effective spaces for any of the buses to facilitate our light rail stations are going to be a big focus. And also discussing potentially putting in some more um, alternative means of transit to get people to and from the, the very beneficial stations that will be. Thank you. The last prepared question this evening. Uh, will... oh. I'm, yeah. Will be okay, there. Sorry, we're getting the last prepared question in the chat, and it will be asked by Shep. Over to you, Shep. The city has been a home in a homeless state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong, and what steps will you take to address the crisis? So. What the city is doing wrong and what the city is doing right are both complicated answers. Um, we're doing a lot of things somewhat right, but we also have to recognize that our problem doesn't exist in a vacuum. We have a regional homelessness issue. So the spaces are where we find success. We commonly don't recognize it because there's such an influx of individuals when things get better that it's almost imperceptible because there's so many people outside of the area that we don't see. Um, but some of the things that the city really needs to focus on improving on is our wraparound services. When we get people out of homelessness that have been in cycles of um, mental health crisis, that have been in cycles of addiction, um, if we don't have the wraparound services to help them feel supported once they get out of those spaces, it really ensures that they're going to go back to those communities that were 
the only communities that they know and commonly those communities are engaging in the bad behaviors that resulted in them becoming unhoused to begin with. So not only do we have to focus on getting people into transitional housing, climbing over a lot of the trust deficit we have with many of these communities, but also making sure that they are supported and have a path out that gives them some opportunity to feel confident that they are not going to be trapped in the cycle again. Um, despondency is a huge issue there and transitional housing is going to be important. Also, our homelessness issue is a housing issue that is at its core our biggest problem. We do not have enough houses. So continuing to make sure that we are green lighting uh, the development in a responsible way that makes for affordable housing and then helping people once they're in those houses is the single most effective way to bring down our housing prices. Thank you so much, Shane. That concludes the formal questions that we had prepared. And now the part of the interview that we'll go into is follow up. I will call on eboard members who raise their hands. They will ask you a question and then we'll have one minute to answer those. Jeremy. Um, yeah, you mentioned a lot about sort of the expansion of light rail and also you also mentioned like station access. Can you um so I mean one of the big things that'll be happening in the near future is the 130th station. Um, can you give a little bit of your vision for what you would do to help people get there or live nearby? So for me, the 130th Street station has a lot of great opportunity with it, but currently the city doesn't own any of the land that's around that station. So development is going to be uniquely complicated because none of the legwork that was done for any of the, the other stations has been done yet. Also with the other ends, when you get to Lake City and you get over to Aurora, they're both prime spaces that have land that has not been particularly well used and is primed to be developed in a way that displaces the least amount of people and gives a lot of economic opportunity to those areas. So for me, around 130th, I think if we were to use something like an electric trolley or a bus system that has the ability to take people very efficiently back and forth on those roads, we can build those developments that are walkable and give people five minute bus rides in those directions that get them to that. Thank you, Shane. And it does being the first time at 50 seconds. So if you want to say a few more thoughts after that, you've got it. I just happened to be done with my thoughts about Perfect. this thing, so. Toby, over to you. Uh, so I'm asking this follow-up question of all city council candidates. Inclusionary housing is explicitly allowed by the recently passed state level missing middle zoning bill to help ensure production of more low-income housing in every community. How would you support using inclusionary housing in Seattle? Uh, great question. Um, it's the passing of 1110 is huge in addressing a lot of our hurdles that have been used to exclude people from development. I think the city needs to take a really good hard look at what the MFA is achieving because I think that is putting a huge financial burden on people's ability to actually develop their land in a meaningful way. So I want to make sure that we are clearing the roadblocks for people to build those additional spaces if they want to. Um, we're incentivizing people directly for those developments and we are making sure that we're not um, clinging on to old suburban design uh, tactics uh, in a way that's preventing people from being able to maximize those spaces and expand their housing in a way that it's good for them. Um, but for me, making sure that we have the space that's available and addressing some of the, the planning hurdles uh, is some of the biggest issues that I think we're going to run into. Chef? You're next. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, I'm just wondering, do you have any ideas about how to improve or tackle the east-west um, transit issue? In other words, we have a pretty developed north-south um, system, but going east and west is virtually impossible. So thoughts about that? I do. I have several thoughts about that. <laughs> um, it's up in Maple Leaf. If I want to go over to Bitter Lake, I have to take a bus into downtown before I head back north. It's an entirely unfeasible system, and we need to have more buses. We need SDOT to put into its budget the buses that will take us east to west, because there's no reason that they don't exist. We just haven't budgeted for them yet. We need to prioritize the ability 
for neighborhoods in the North End to be able to get to other neighborhoods in the North End. And, and living up here, seeing in Lake City, it's also a detriment for a lot of people's economic opportunities. If somebody has a job over in Bitter Lake and they live in Lake City, that's an hour and a half bus ride sometimes for them to get there, assuming the bus actually shows up on time. So I wanna make sure that we get those buses where they're needed because from everything that I have researched, there's no reason they're not there. They're just happy. Thank you so much. Laura Marie has our next question and I absolutely agree with you that uh, my daughter takes an hour and a half to get from Queen Anne to Nathan Hale. Laura Marie. Hi, uh, my favorite question for our candidates is what about this job is particularly appealing to you? And can you tell us something that probably most voters don't know about this position? So the thing that interests me the most about this position is I get to be a voice for a lot of people that don't necessarily always get heard. Um, and that's something that's important for me. It's, I'm, I like to think of myself as fair, but I also recognize that I get very frustrated when people get shouted down in conversations. As it turns out, growing up in a space where my opinion wasn't particularly valued, I tend to get a little more vocal about other people because I recognize how it was done to me. So I'm excited for this opportunity to stand up for so many people that haven't been included in this conversation. Um, and Something that a lot of people don't probably know in regards to uh, the position itself. Mm. I recognize I don't know the answer to that. I'm just gonna admit it, I'm not entirely sure. Thank you, Sherry. You mentioned drainage, one of my pet subjects. Um, and I know that's a big issue, um, you know, up here in the North End. Uh, and it's the reason that, aside from cost, that we don't get to have sidewalks. And so what um, what are your thoughts on how to improve it? And I know there's all kinds of uh, creative ways to make sidewalks or safe places for people to walk and ride bikes. And um, But do you have any examples of how you would tackle this issue? Sidewalks are definitely something that, as somebody in District 5, we all know that it is a pain point for a lot of people because we're also deeply underserving many of our disabled uh, community members because they can't get around. There's no sidewalk for them. Unfortunately, sidewalks can run up to a million dollars a block, and that was as of, I think, seven years ago. An increased cost for goods has gone up by about 30% in the last four years. So getting sidewalks in is something that is... I don't want to say cost prohibitive because I don't want to suggest that I'm going to put a, put a hurdle in between me and trying to make that happen for District 5. But we need to be very intentional about the way we do it to serve the most amount of people. But I think by designing our sidewalk system to go along with the opening of the 145th and the 130th Street Station, we can dramatically increase the amount of people that get access to them and we can make sure that they're actually built to accessible standards so everybody in our neighborhood can use them including people that have walkers or wheelchairs or other mobility assistance devices. Toby, you are our last question of the evening. Oh, you're on mute, Toby. It, it's a crowded candidate field. What's your uh, strategy as a candidate? Oh, you're muted again. I'll leave my hand on the thing. I should get it away. What's your strategy to get through the primary and win as a candidate? So I think that I've got the unique advantage of being able to really um, speak specifically to some of the hurdles that come along with people's perception of the intersection between crime, homelessness, and our um, unhoused communities. I get the point of view of somebody who is a mental health support worker and I can see where our housing policies are actually actively conflicting with some of our um, attempts to assist our homeless population and being able to speak with uh, confidence and intentionality and have a real plan for how to address this, I think is a huge uh, boon for me because I can demonstrate to people that I'm not just here to perform 
uh, the idea that I'm going to be socially just. I'm actually telling you the things that I'm going to do to actually make a just solution for this that allows people to improve their lives and to helps to resolve homelessness. I'm talking to myself. Thank you so much, Shane. That concludes the, the formal part of our evening tonight. We will stop recording and Jeremy will be giving you a brief overview, or perhaps I will, because Jeremy's trying to do some